Let's uh, read the word. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, it says here. During the night, Jacob, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, his eleven sons, crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn became too great. When the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and, and, and wrecked it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. For now, from now on you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named, named the place Spiniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life is spared. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you at this moment knowing that, uh, you know, you care so much about us. And, and this guy named Jacob in the Bible is just so similar to all of us. He's so similar to the things that we go through, Lord. And it's so nice of you to put him in the Bible for us to reflect on and maybe see a little bit of ourselves and see a little bit of what you are doing in our lives. We ask you tonight that you can minister in our lives, God. It's so important for you to touch us. It's so important for us to minister to our lives and, and to make us understand who you are and, and what you're doing in our lives. We ask you all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little stuffed up from too much air conditioning because of the heat. So my sinuses go, so I'm a little stuffed up. Don't, um, I apologize for that. But who, who knows the story of Jacob? Who has heard of Jacob before? Come on, raise your hand. Does everybody know what Jacob means? Traitor. Huh? Close. What does that mean in English? Supplant line. That's so foreign. <laughs> Try something like less, like, like you know, supplanter. How many of you guys know what a supplanter is? Huh? Supplanter is a guy that, let's say he's a cheater. That's the best translation. So what he's, he was called a cheater. Oh, a cheater. A cheater. You're so quick, man. And just like, it's amazing what you can do with look at. But the guy's name was Cheater. And I want you guys to understand because we don't have this problem. You know, we have like real names. They had names that had to do with their lives. Their names meant something. They name kids or they name people based on what they thought they were going to become. So when they saw this kid, they called him Cheater. That's pretty bad. Huh? That's what they thought of him. So, you know, you look in the Bible, all these names end with E-L. You see all the Bible? And then, you know, Ezekiel. All these names E-L. You know what E-L means in, in, in Hebrew? It means God. So all these names have to do with God. So if when they wanted to bless somebody, they were called something that had to do with God. This is going to be a blessing from God or, or the hand of God or all these things that had to do with God. You know, when they didn't have any inspiration, they named what they saw. So his brother was named Esau. You know what it means? Harry. So that's what he's called. So every, you know, he was a hairy kid. So the first thing that came to mind was, let's call this guy Harry. That was his call. So when you walk down the street, they literally call, hey, Harry. Pretty sad. You know, that gene, right? But think about it. We don't have this problem today, right? So we sometimes don't understand the pressure it's like to be called something or have expectations of of who you are, your name for that. But we, we feel that, right? You feel like people, you know, expect I mean I'm a past a pastor, right? So it's expected all my kids are gonna be pastors, and I first thing I told them, don't be a pastor. And they look at me and people are like, why would you say that? Because if you're not called, I'm giving an expectation of something that's just too hard for them to fulfill. Too hard for them to endure. I don't know if you guys feel that way. 
people looked at you or your parents or looked at the situation that you lived in and they have expectations of what you're supposed to do. And that's hard. How does it feel to live to expectations? Oh, it sucks. sucks. Does it suck? Mm -hmm. yeah. Live, Gosh. people think that you should be something. That's what, the, that's what I'm saying, the story of Jacob is very, very human. It's very us. It's like no matter how different the time changes, we can relate to this guy. I mean, he had to wrestle with a lot of things. And we're going to talk about wrestling today. We to wrestle with the things that, he had to wrestle with things that we have to wrestle all the time with. One of the things that um, he had to wrestle with is who he was. He had to wrestle with his identity. And we all have to do that, you know, especially at your age, you're finding out who you are. You know, it, it's, it's hilarious, you know, you're a kid and, 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 you know, you're told not to touch anything. Then you're telling a teenager, you're told you can touch those things that you couldn't touch. But for years you've been programmed, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then when you're older, they're like, why aren't you doing it? It's like, you told me I couldn't do all this stuff now, but why are you doing it now? See, there's, a, there's an identity crisis here, you know? You know, you, could, you can't do this, and you can do this, and it's all these things that bother us. And there's kids today who don't know who they are. There's people today, there's adults today. You know, when I went to school, I, I'm, a, I'm a late guy. I was a late bloomer, so I went to school eight years after high school. First time I went to college. So I went to college, and I'm in there, and I was in computer classes, and I'm just programming and, and learning how to deal with computers and putting them apart and all that stuff. And I realized that most of the people in my class were all going to college the second time. And I go, I ask them, so why are you guys going to school again? Did you guys go to college already? He goes, yeah. But now we want, we're doing what we want. And I said, what do you mean you're doing what we want? The first time, we did it, we did what our parents told us to do. We did what, you know, what the society told us to do. When we went to work, we hated it. I said, so what do you do now? We're going back to school to do stuff you like. And I said, have you done that the first time? Yeah, but we screwed up. And I was just like, wow. It took eight years for me to go to school. And now all these people with me who hate what they do, you know, and they're cool jobs, you know, admitted, you know, business administrators, uh, you know, um, human resource specialists, and I'm like, dude, you guys all have like these masters, and, and they hate what they do. And I'm like, wow, there's an identity crisis. Whether you're young or old, you know, and what, one of the things that God was trying to, to teach Jacob was to how to find who you want. And he struggled. You know, if you look in the Bible in Genesis chapter 25, which is a couple chapters, you know, four or five chapters before what we read, it talks about him being born. And the Bible says that, And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two nations. For from the beginning, the two nations will be rivals. The one nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve the younger son. And when the time came to birth, Rebecca discovered that she did have twins, the first one was, was very, very red at birth and covered in thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hands grasped on Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. So the whole idea is that they, they could have found a better name to call this guy. They could have called him Fighter. They could have called a guy that is, you know, like... He, he's committed. I mean, but because he was born holding on to his brother's ankle, which is very odd to begin with, as they're yanking the kid out, there's his brother yanking like, I'm here too. You know? Don't forget me. All because, and it's funny, because our society doesn't have this, you know? If you have like 10 kids and you have an inheritance, it'll be divided in 10 kids. And in, in Jacob's time, you could have 10 kids, but the firstborn gets everything every single dollar. It's really odd. So if he had a million dollars, the first child gets a million dollars. Well, that's how it worked back then. It wasn't fair. It, it, and it was a thing that, it was very interesting because, and these guys were patriarchs, so they, they, they set the standard. So whoever they blessed, it's very interesting, whoever they put their hands on somebody, and bless them, all the anointing from God would go from them to their kids. To that specific kid. So in Jacob's mind, he was like seconds away from being the firstborn. He was seconds away from being the guy who inherits everything. You know? And that has been like 
stamp this word. Your name means cheater. It's like basically he walking around and riddle call and say, Hey cheater! Yeah, that's yeah. How you doing? Hi cheater, how you doing? It's it's not like, you know, you know, if I call, you know, Andrew, it's not like that. Basically, they've been calling them cheater. You know, whiner, whatever you want to call. The thing that he called them all the time, and it's all he heard. You're a cheater. You're a cheater. You're a cheater. So one day he's sitting there, and he's he doesn't know who he is. Everybody calls him a cheater. Everyone calls him useless. And he's there, and he's and he's cooking, right? He's cooking some lentil soup, and his brother's coming from hunting, and his brother's exhausted. And he looked at his brother, and he said, "I'm a cheater anyway. Sell me your inheritance. I want to be the first one." He goes, "Get out of here. Give me some of that lentil soup. I'm not. I cook this soup. It's my soup. I do what I want." Give me your inheritance. And he goes, I don't care about the inheritance and give him a soup. He goes, I don't care if I'm a cheater. I don't care. All this stuff was building up because he didn't know who he was. Why am I saying this? Because we a lot of times react when we don't know who we are. When we don't know our purpose in life. You know, a, a lot of the you guys probably heard the story of the kid who killed himself in, in Mount Vernon, right? Everybody heard about Miguel who killed himself in Mount Vernon? It's scary. He shot himself? He hung himself, which is worse. Thank you. <laughs> but it's scary. It's scary. I mean, I don't, I don't know him. I, he, he's been here. He's been in a lot of places. Um, but I don't really know him that well. But I could imagine if it was my kid hanging himself. Think about it for a second. He didn't know who he was. He just killed himself. And he was just a regular kid. He wasn't a bad kid. He wasn't a bad kid. He just didn't know who he was. And under that point of that stress, I, I know if I told you guys a story about one of the guys I went to high school with. Everybody thought he was the one of the most popular kids in school. Nice cars, lived in a nice house. One day he decided to hang himself. In our, my senior year in school, he hung himself. He he was in his closet, and the pole. He was taller than the pole, so he had to hold his legs while he hung himself. That's somebody that really wanted to kill himself. That really didn't feel like living. And and I find that amazing. That why would you not want to live? Or why living such a big deal? Or when you look at things, you know, I don't feel like I, I belong in this world. That's an identity crisis. This guy had the same problem. And he, and he, and he cheated his way because that's what he was called. And, he, and he, he, even when it came to time to, to get the blessing from his father, you know, he dressed up as his brother, put hairs in his, in his, in his, um, in his arms and his, in his face. He, he rubbed the, 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 the sheep you know, skin so he'd smell like sheep, so he'd smell like his brother, and he got the blessing from his father, and he had to run away. And, and, and the thing that I'm trying to get at here is that he didn't know who he was. And, and this struggle, and what I'm trying to get to you guys is that most people here, whether they admit or not, have an identity problem. They don't know who they are. And, 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 and in the midst of this idea, you have a God who is there trying to give you Direction. One of the main things, and it's and hard for people to understand this, because especially when we come from a, a Pentecostal or, or a, a spirit-filled church, where you know we see God. I mean, I see, I've seen God giving me messages to give to people, and I believe in that. But we, we, it's hard for us to understand that God is trying to give us direction. I was preaching the other day in, in my old church, and I was, I was saying God is like putting signs. He puts signs out there. Stop. Go. He doesn't tell you who you should marry. So nobody's going to come to you and say, pray over, uh, this is your girlfriend, this is going to be your... No, this, this is not God. God doesn't do that. What he does, he puts stop signs, he puts right, left, that's what he does. He gives direction. So we, we can figure out which way we should go. And this guy is running away, he's scared, he, uh, he doesn't know who he is. And one of his, you know, and running away, he's running away and he's scared. He goes and he sleeps on a rock. And God gives him a vision. You know why God gives visions? 
to know where we should go. Direction. So he sees, he sleeps in this rock, and he has a dream. In this dream, he sees a huge staircase that goes all the way to heaven. And, and in this staircase that goes to heaven, he sees angels going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And he's like, wow. Why, why is God showing me this? Why am I telling you this? God is always stepping into our life, into our chaos, to tell us that he's near. That he's not... You know, I find it interesting that God doesn't have his hands like this. If you go to psychology, who has ever taken psychology class? Okay. When you go to psychology class, what does this mean when somebody does this? Huh? They're, they're rejecting you, right? They're not interested. That's what, I mean, I've, I've taken psychology class. And if you, if you cross your arms, if you go to, into an interview and that person does this, he's saying, he's not into you. Do you know that? But if somebody opens their arms and puts down, they're saying, you know, they're open to what you're saying. The second you do this, they're just saying they're not open to what you're saying. It's a, it's a body language automatically saying, you can talk all you want, I'm not listening. Right? It's just like crossing the arm. Like Karen. <laughs> that's what it <laughs> But that's what it means. Speak Lord, speak Lord. But that's what it means. Body language. We tell things without even saying the words. This guy's scared. He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know that the worst thing for a pastor or anybody that leads anything that's spiritual is to understand that there could be people in this place and God could be ministering in this place and they still have no idea where they're going. They still don't know if God is real or not. You know, they still don't know if He is alive or not. One of the things I, I'm most concerned with is not being famous, is not being a pastor. One of the things I'm more concerned about is that I can continue to have a relationship with God where I know who He is and He knows who I am. Because I could be famous. I could have a church with a thousand people. But if God doesn't know who I am, if God can't come to my house and come to my life and, and talk to me and, issue, and talk to me about the issues in my life, I don't want to. I don't want to have that kind of lifestyle. This guy was just trying to, to be somebody. Like so many people are trying to be something. But he couldn't find. And God gives him a little vision saying, listen to me. I'm over here. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. We wrestle with who, with who we are. We wrestle with those things that, that, that haunts us. You know, we haunt, this kid, he's a kid. He's wrestling with the mistakes that he had done in the past. How many of you have not wrestled with the mistakes that you've done? All the stuff you did wrong. All the stuff that sometimes people don't know about, but you know. And if they find out, they might teach you different. That's scary, right? There's so many people, there's so many kids. There's so many people who don't know. They live in so, so many secrets and so many things are hidden. And to God, nothing is hidden. You know, it's funny. You know, the Bible says that everything is open to God. Everything. He knows every single bad thing you ever did. And He still loves you. It's pretty amazing. You wrestle with the things in your heart. You wrestle with your identity. You wrestle with, sometimes with your parents. You, you wrestle with the people that you love. And all those things are just eating you up inside. And, and you want to be you. You know, I remember one day when I was praying, and I was in, you know, in, in church, and I hear God's voice, and God says something to me. What I found interesting is, he, he said, Alex, don't stop being a kid. And I said, what, what, what do you mean, Lord? Don't stop being a kid. I said, you know, and I'm not saying because I'm, I'm silly, or I'm just like crazy. He says, don't stop being a kid. The heart of a kid. The heart of someone that, you know, when you come to a kid, you know, he, he if you, you know, if you, you know, you, you might kick my, my daughter kicks my son, mm -hmm. and they're fighting for the next, like, 20 minutes, like they're going to kill themselves. Five minutes later, they're, like, playing on. <laughs> the same kids that were just, like, wanting to kill each other, five minutes later, are, like, laughing and playing. Adults don't do that. Mm -hmm. Adults, when they fight, 
they don't talk for years. Kids, they fight and they turn around and they're like, all right, you're my team, okay? <laughs> they forget. When we are kids in our heart, we, we forgive people. There's people here who haven't forgiven their parents, who haven't forgiven their boyfriend, they haven't forgiven, you know, people who are important in their life, and they keep holding that stuff in. They haven't forgiven, they haven't let go because they want to be so badly being an adult. They want so badly to have that attitude. And God said, you know, be like children. Be like children. Look at people and forgive them. Look at people and, and realize you're just like them. Making mistakes. You know, we make mistakes all the time, but we think we're perfect. It's called an identity crisis. Jesus came down here to show us what perfect was. Perfect serve, wash people's feet, perfect prayed all night, perfect saw people and had compassion. That's perfect. God is perfect. Perfect love unconditionally. Perfect, it, it looked at someone that was sick and gave them hope. Perfect saw somebody that was possessed by a demon and set them free. That's perfect. We're not perfect. We look at people and we say, I don't like the way you look, man. That's not spiritual. That's unperfect. Because perfect looked at somebody and said, you know, they looked at me like they're sheep without a shepherd. He was willing to be the shepherd to people who were willing to be their sheep. Do you understand? When God is trying to change your identity or find out who you are. I was preaching the other day and, I, and, I, and God gave me this, this idea in my heart. You know, and, and it's amazing. You know, when the Bible says that we are wonderfully and fearfully made, it's an idea, a concept that in God's heart, when He created us, you know, there was a fear of God that came upon us. Or when God created, you know, Isaac, I'm using him as a, a sample. I'm sorry. When, when God created Isaac, He already structured all the stuff He thought He could do. His purpose in life was meant. And when God looked at it, he, it, 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 it brought fear. He looked at him and said, wow. When he created you, he said, wow. Because he saw and projected all the purpose of that person. Each single one of you. And so we look in the mirror and we go, oh my God, that's it. I look awful. I'm not going to school today. <laughs> right? Is that how we do it? Oh my God, I have my mood. I look terrible. But when God looked at you, before he finished the creation, he said, wow, tremendous, tremendous potential, tremendous ability, tremendous capability. And we struggle with our identity because God's identity for us is one thing, and who we are trying to be like is another thing. So this kid named Jacob had an identity problem, just like everybody else. Had. He had a desire problem. He was wrestling with what he wanted. Wow, that's a big one. We wrestle constantly with what we want. In his case, he wanted this girl. Wow, he's like, this girl's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. He's so beautiful. He's so beautiful. So he, he goes and he's like, ask your dad to marry her. And he's saying, dad said, fine. So he's like, yeah, I'm going to marry this girl. And he's like, oh, happy. And, he's, and he said, no, but you got to wait seven years. He's like, that's all right, I'm patient. Seven years. So you wait seven years. And this girl is it's like, this is the most beautiful girl in the world. So he goes, and they have they have a week of party. That's how the Jewish people do it. So they're partying for a week. The girl is not allowed to take her veil off. He doesn't see her face. He only sees her face the night they, they get married. So they have a party, and he doesn't see her face until the next day. And it was her sister. And he's like, goes to the father. Well, you cheated me, man. He goes, but aren't you the cheater? <laughs> he says, he goes, in my culture, we can't marry the youngest before the oldest. So you have to marry the oldest first. That's why the, the text says she had, he had two wives. He didn't want to have two wives. He wanted one wife. But he wanted so badly. He, and the father says, ah, oh, you're going to have to spend another seven years for the other one. <laughs> And they work for free for seven years because of one girl. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
sometimes what we want, we wrestle with. I want that, I want that iPad, I want that like this, I want that like that. I like that boy so much, right? It cost him 14 years of his life. With what we want might cost us a price that we are not necessarily willing to pay. The lesson here on Jacob's life is that he wanted something so bad he was willing to waste 14 years of his life. Now, the same thing is going to come up in your life. There's stuff that you're going to really want. I'm really going to date that boy. They're just so cute. <laughs> but some of us are willing to do anything. You know, we give our, our bodies, we give everything, just because we want to date that boy or date that girl. You know, some of us will be willing to smoke pot or do drugs because we want to fit in. Those have a cost. What we want, what we wrestle with, what we want has a cost. And are we willing to pay that price? And I, I said, uh, uh, yes, last night, we, me and my wife, we watched these, these um, you know, these Discovery Channel or, or, um, or, or different time, you know, reality TVs, and we're talking, seeing, Kids that were addicted, you know, there's a show called the Addiction, and it's really hard. When you see these guys that are either addicted of alcohol or a crystal meth or, or or heroin, and they're really, really, really trying. It was just a bad decision. Do you know that everything we we life is about decisions. One little decision can ruin your life. One little decision can change everything. You know, one decision, and you know, one bad decision, you can be in jail. You might not even done anything, but you can be in jail. Wrestling with what you want is something we need to learn. Jacob didn't hurt, didn't learn. He was an example of what not to do, right? You know, 11 kids later, right? He had four wives, <laughs> two wives and two cucumbites. He only won one. Mm. But because what he wanted was so badly, and he wanted to make happy that one person so badly, he ended up with two wives and two other wives that were just servant wives. Just to make everybody happy. See, what you want has a cost sometimes. Are you willing to pay that cost for what you want? So when God is trying to teach us how to learn to deal with what we want, is what we want something we're willing to live for? What we want. I remember I used to hear this, you know, this this saying years ago. If you're not willing to stand up for something, you'll be willing to fall for anything. You hear what that says? If you're not willing to stand up for something, you'll be willing to fall for anything. And that's what a lot of people are. They don't stand up for anything. They don't stand up for their faith. They don't stand up for their God. And they fall for anything that, that shows, that meets their first need. They're wrestling for identity. So if you feel like nobody loves you, and then some cute boy comes and says, you know, you're beautiful. I love you so much. And you're like, what? <laughs> it's just to fulfill that first identity, that whole idea of who you are, you're willing to do anything. And that's... Plenty of girls today who are pregnant, underage, they're not ready to be mocked. Because some boys said they loved them. And I'm not saying they didn't. I'm saying that their heart wasn't ready for that. So they're wrestling with what they want. You wrestle with who you are, and you wrestle with what you want. And then we have this text here. That we have this guy wrestling with God. And that's what we are all the time. Whether you're here, where you want to say it, where you don't want to say it, where you're in church, you're wrestling with God. And how do you wrestle with God? Because God has a purpose. You know, I, I, I mean, I see today, it's been like 20 years since I became a Christian. Actually, next week, what is it this week? What, what day is it, the 18th? So I think next week, I've been, I, the 27th of July is when I became a Christian, 1992. So it'll be like 21 years, I think. Since I become a Christian, and I, it, it was a big long trip, you know, it, it's it's a long journey. But now I can see all the, you know, all the preparation that God did, all the things He had to move, you know, 
you know, the, he had to convince me of certain things, you know. He couldn't just save me right away. It didn't work that way. I mean, I saw, today I see what he did. You know, like when originally I was a, a very heavy into drugs and drugs and drugs and drugs. And then, you know, I, I was working and, and I wasn't able to feed my, my vice because you can never feed when you're consuming that much. And I kept doing and doing and doing. And then I realized that, I, you know, I need to be rich to be happy. So I stopped reducing my drug load and started aiming for being rich. And that was a trick that God did. Because he had to get me to a different place where I was a little more stable and a little more sober. So he took me to a place, and I, I now I wanted to be, you know, a millionaire. But I didn't realize that the people that I wanted to be a millionaire with were Christians. And they were all businessmen, but they were all Christians. And they were millionaires. And I'm going, yeah, I want to be just like you guys. I didn't realize that these guys knew God. And God was just playing with me. He was just playing with me. And, and, and I, I remember I went to this big conference. It was like three three days. It was in um, Virginia. And it was like in a huge a building in Virginia. That, and they had all these motivational speakers. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to be millionaires. And the guy's like, but you guys want to see a really good motivational speaker? You come here Sunday morning, early in the morning, 9 o'clock. There's going to be the best motivational speaker. He's going to tell you totally the secret of living. And I, go, and I went, yeah. Let's say I want to be a rich dude, man. I want to be somebody. And the guy's going to tell me the secret. So I was like, Friday night, Saturday night. And I'm going, yes, yeah, Sunday morning. I'm going to go there. And the guy's going to teach me how to be a millionaire. So I go in the morning, and it was a church service. <laughs> and the guy said, you know, I have $30 million in the bank. But the most important thing I have is my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I went, <laughs> First, I was wrestling with who I am. So I was doing drugs because it made me feel good. And I didn't have to deal with it. And then I realized that what I wanted is to be rich. And then I was wrestling with what I want. And then now, after I realized I want to be rich, and now I'm wrestling with God. Because I didn't want to be Christian. I wanted to be a millionaire. And the millionaire told me that the, for you to be successful, you need to know God. And I started wrestling with God. And that's what we do here. You come to church here, and I, I, I give you a word, and then you start wrestling with it. Is Pastor crazy? Is he really, does he really talk to God? Does God really talk to him? What if he really does? Sometimes I come in here, and I feel some wacky stuff. I, feel, I don't know if it's God, or I feel like there's something like electricity coming through my body, and I don't know what that is, you know? It's like, God. Ah. And you start wrestling with God. That's what it, this guy is. And, and, and what God did here, he, he said to Jacob, Jacob, go back home. I got everything covered. He said, go back home. Because his problem was his brother. He cheated his brother. He, his brother was, was a very big and strong and mean dude. And, and, and God said, send him back. Because he had to deal with He had to wrestle with him. And God is going to wrestle with you until he blesses you. Until you decide you want your blessing. You want to receive the thing that God prepared for you. And when you realize that you want it more than you want all the other stuff in your life, you notice that he had all his kids with him and all his fortune with him. And he sent everybody away. And he was alone. He was alone from them. He was alone. He was thinking about, I mean, what am I going to do when I meet my brother? He traveled a good distance. You know, and, 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 and he saw God, angels around him. The text before says that he was walking and he saw, the, he saw an army of angels. He really saw them. And now he's alone and that guy shows up. And he starts wrestling with him. He's wrestling with him. And the night's coming through. And, he's, and, and and he's wrestling with this guy. Trying to get his blessing. He's willing to say to the guy that, you know, if you, I'm let, letting you go until you bless me. You know, if I wrestle with you, you know, I'm not going to sit there and wrestle with you to get a blessing from you, right? I'm, a, I'm wrestling because I want to drop, right? <laughs> That's the normal, right? I'm not wrestling with the guy because I want... So what, he's understanding this guy is just not a man. This guy is more than a man. Because there was nobody around him. And this, this guy shows up, and he doesn't know who he is, but he, he understands this guy is different. And he starts wrestling with him, and it's not to kill him, but to be blessed by him. 
amazing. And, and that's what we do in church and what we do in this youth. We're, we're wrestling with what we think God is and we're wrestling with the, God's identity in our life. And, and we wrestle until God realizes that we really want Him more than we want anything. You know, I, I came to church and I was this, this raw Christian. I wasn't polished at all. You couldn't send me into a seminar. You couldn't send me anywhere. You know, I couldn't speak Portuguese. I couldn't speak in front of anybody. I couldn't do anything. I was very raw. I was like a diamond, you know, that's charcoal, that's coal, and then, and it's compressed to the point where it becomes a diamond. And and I was very raw. I wasn't. I wasn't. You know, I wasn't polished speaking. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know any any theology. I was very raw. But I wanted God so bad because somehow I I, I, I I was able to struggle with that God and find that He was better than anything that I could imagine. I was willing to give up everything that I that I thought was important to me. For the first time in my life, I realized that I knew who I was. And I was happy with that. I wasn't happy because I was rich. I wasn't happy because, but because I realized who God was and who I was in God. This guy here, he starts wrestling with God. The truth, he was wrestling with Jesus before Jesus came to earth to be born. He came and, and these, these moments, and he's wrestling with God, wrestling with Jacob, trying to find out if he has, he's in a position to change. Why am I telling you this? Because God is always working us so we get in a position to change. To change. And that's hard. Even worse for, for young people. They don't want to change. But changing is amazing. Changing could be, you know, a door that God opens for you. When, 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 when God came into my life, for the first three weeks of church, I, I was bored. You know, I was so bored in church. And then they said to me, you know, you have to pray. And I said, okay, I'm going to go pray. So I started praying. But I, I couldn't figure this thing out. So I, I, I said, Lord, you know, what, what is this thing to pray? Don't you, don't you guys feel like that? And I start praying and praying. And, and nobody talked back to me. And I thought, this is really boring. Because I'm talking to God and you know, nobody talks back to me. And then first week, second week, third week. And then, and then almost a month, in, they said, you know, I want you to come with me to this church in the Bronx. And I said, wow, in the Bronx. And, I, and it was really the bad, and when bad section. We, we drove by and there was at least 50, you know, Mercedes Benz parked. Of all the drug dealers that lived, you know, in and, 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 and Prospect Street, you know, Prospect Street in the Bronx is, and it's, yeah, okay. and we're driving now. As we get under 95, there's a this little theater, and we go in there, and I get in that place, right, and and it was a, a Spanish church, and I, you know, I can't speak Spanish. I'm sorry, guys. Now I'm better. Back then, it was horrible. I can barely, I can barely speak Portuguese. Spanish, forget it. So I go in that place and the pastor will preach for an hour and a half. I didn't understand anything he said. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Absolutely nothing he said. I said, wow, I spent an hour and a half and I have no idea what the guy said. And then he gets up and says, I'm going to minister the Holy Spirit to somebody. And he starts praying for me. There's about 900 people in that state. And for two hours he prayed. And he prayed. And he prayed. And people would be like, baptized with the Holy Spirit and they're going, you know, wow. you know, and I love the Spanish because they start dancing. <laughs> and they're dancing, I'm like, oh, I said, well, wow, that's cool. I've never seen that before. I was like, wow, that is so cool that you're like spinning around and they're dancing and doing this stuff. And I said, wow, there's so much like so much more fun. So I'm I'm sitting there and, and they're praying and they're praying and nothing. I, I spent an hour and I'm like sweating now. And I'm going, Lord, you know, this is not working for me, God. And one of the guys in our church looked at me and says, you know, pray like you believe. And I went, I got offended, man. He says, don't pray like you just go into the emotions. Pray like you want. Pray like you believe. So I looked at him. I closed my eyes. And I said, if you're real, 
and, and you took you took me all out of these drugs, and I'm and I'm sober. I don't smoke anymore, and I I don't drink anymore, and I'm all this guy. And if you're real, then then touch me now, and then boom. That shy dude just got baptized with the Holy Spirit, right? I, I was jumping out the, I, without bending my knees. I jumped about this high. They have videotape of me. Carlos that in my lineup. Did he take everything? Did he take me back and get baptized the Holy Spirit? So I'm like jumping up in the air, right? And I've now experienced something that the Bible calls a submerging in God's power. And I'm, from that on, I realized that, you know, everything that I had done in my life was absolutely not important. All the stuff that I wanted, all the money that I wanted, all the things that I could obtain, they were instantly not important anymore to me. From that moment on, all I wanted to do was to be close to that God that I met that day. The God that I wrestled in that place. When this guy comes out of this wrestling thing, limping, right? He's not walking like this. He doesn't care about if his brother's mad at him or not. He doesn't care because he just wrestled with God. He had an experience with God. That's what I mean. He had an experience with God, and he was never the same again. I was in the uh, on on Sunday. We were at the uh, at the um, church in Mount Vernon, and when we walked in that place, I, I felt like an amazing presence of God. And, and I'm very sensitive. And I'm like, wow, something going on. Something's different. You know, we had to, we had Friday, we had Saturday, it was great, but it was even more on Sunday. And I was like, wow. Imagine if we had the same people here on Sunday we had on Saturday. I said, wow, this is amazing. And I'm sitting there and I and I'm you know and I'm feeling God's presence and I'm starting to hear God speak. And I and I get to the to the when the pastor preached a wonderful message, and when I got up to to, to, to ask us for praying. As I get up, I hear God speak to me. Pray for these kids. Because they need to fill me. They need to have an encounter with me. They need to know who I am for themselves. So you're not praying for them to, to, to cry. You're praying them to, to, to have a connection with me. To have an encounter with you. And I kept praying for people. And it was, you know, it was quick, right? It was quick. You're the last one I prayed for, right? And it was amazing. Because, you know, it was just, you know, and I could have, it was about another four or five people. Service had to end. But it was about four or five people that got, had mentioned to me that he wanted me to pray for. Your brother was one of them. I never got to him. He was going to be like, bow. When God talks to me, I know something's gonna happen. So he's like, "Go pray for him." Like I can't. He's all the way in the back. I can't get to him. You know. You know. And as I'm praying for people, God's saying, "Pray for her. Pray for her." Pastor's already talking, and God said, "Don't listen to him. Pray for her. Pray for her." And I'm like, "I don't want to be disrespectful, but I'm praying for these people because I know that God wants them to. And God needs to have a connection with them. God needs to have a reaction in their life where they no longer walk." the same. See what happened to him? He no longer walked the same. He no longer was called a cheater. Nobody ever called him Jacob anymore. He was Israel. A father of many nations. He was different. He had an encounter with God and his name was changed. His purpose was changed. His direction was changed. When you wrestle with God, your life will change. Your purpose will change. Your direction will change. Who you know God is will change forever. And all my life, for the last 20 years, all I do is trying to get back to that night. I, I pray trying to get to that place. I, I, I pray for people trying to get them to the same place that I know. That place where God needs us. The place that where God gets in our stuff and says, I'm here too. And I have a purpose. This guy was, and I find it amazing, because every time God exposes himself, he would say, you know, I am the guy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, I'm, and I always wonder, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the, I'm, I'm the God of Abraham, the one that has faith. 
I am the God of Isaac, the one that was perfect, and I'm the God of the cheater. <laughs> Basically, he's saying, I'm the God of the cheater. Amazing. God is the God of those who are super faithful. He's God of the perfect, but he's also the God of the cheater. The God who's got broken, the God who makes mistakes, the God that hasn't had all the, the right answers, the God who's always falling behind is the God of every single one of those kinds of people. And I don't know, you know, when we come to youth, it's nice. But, you know, there's, there's, a, there's something that God wants from us. It's more than just, you know, we, were, we already got uh, from our high of the conference. We're all excited and we're all going to, you know. But God wants more. I, I've been feeling that in my heart. I've been feeling that in my soul. I mean, I started fasting again, and, and I've been fasting for that. For that exact thing. That God would touch your life. That God will just ignite you guys. Because we start coming to this place, and this place becomes almost like a hangout. And God doesn't want that for you. He wants to ignite your life. He wants to change the way you walk. And that's not because I want you to have a different swag. It's not about that. It's about, it's the way you walk with purpose. It's what desire God has put in your life. It's about the calling that's inside you. You know, I walk around and I see people, and it's hard for me. That's one of the things that I have a problem with. I walk around and I see people, and sometimes you'll say something, and I'll see what God has called you to do. And then I have to sit there and not tell you, because if I tell you, you're going to freak out, and I have to just kind of like, you know, just, okay, just turn left and turn right, you know. You should, this is what, I mean, I've seen guys preach in church, and God reveals me what you're supposed to be, and I'm like, wow, when am I going to do that kid? You know? I had a kid in my end. He was um, in our church, and he was a, he was just, you know, a regular teenager. And I asked him to preach one day, and God showed me his, if God called him to be a pastor, and he preached. And he's, he's really like from the hip country of Minas Gerais, you know, really just, oh, hey. yeah, just really, you know, <laughs> slow, you know, very just, you know, from, he was from like, you know, the farm country, and, and I'm like, God, you know, what? And I'm going, I can't just let the kids sit there. He, you gave him something that, you know, he's supposed to be in the pulpit. And I have to, and I'm, I worked for this kid for three years. Did you preach now, man? The kid's amazing. The kid's amazing. And he was all sad. On Sunday, I went to preach in Bridgeport, and he's all like, all sad. And then, you were there, right? And, and, I, and I preached the word, and then I was all on fire that day. And so I come to the kid, and I go, and I grabbed him, and I grabbed his hand, and I said, all right, Lord, let him have it. <laughs> Jesus. He's like, nah. it looks like he was like, got a shock. Looks just, he's like, nah. Nah. <laughs> what am I saying? God is trying to ignite you. Ignite the purpose in your life. When we walk around, and I see these things. It's like little halos around your head, you know? Things that God has called you to do that you need to prepare yourself. You need to be able to understand. But you're not going to do it until you get to that place where you wrestle with God. And you ask Him, I'm not leaving until you bless me. I'm not leaving until you give me what I want, which is to be close to you. Let's stand up for a second. In 1996, 2006, feels like In 2007, in November of 2007, a guy came up to me in Bridgeport and said that, he said to me, which is, you know, I don't know, it really ticked me off. He said to me that, you know, at my church was, the, it, people didn't go to my church because they didn't think that, that uh, there was any power there. And that really insulted me and I was really upset. So from December, I think it was December. Hello? Hello? It was December 8th. I fasted 10 days straight. I didn't eat. I had only water for 10 days. I was so mad. I was furious. I didn't want to eat for 10 days. How could dare somebody call God's church uh, powerless? How could dare somebody? For 10 days, I wouldn't eat. And I, you know, I, I lost 22 pounds. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I didn't eat. I lost 22 pounds. I went from 220, uh, 228 to, two, to 203, 204. I was like, Phew. and all I ask God is, is, is from never again, they would say that about his church. 
And I'm saying the last day I was exhausted. And when you fast for 10 days, your body's exhausted. You know, walking down the street made me tired. So all I did was pray and drink water. And, and I go days like that, days like that. So I'm the last day and I'm praying. And, and, and I'm sitting there and, and I'm about to give up my fast. And I said, and I'm talking to God. And I said, God, I want you to touch me. Just like, just touch me with your little finger, Lord. <laughs> So I'm praying, right? And I'm, I'm on my knees and I'm praying. And I felt like somebody touched me. Like with the little thing in the back of my I felt like that. And my whole body went to the ground. Instantly. And I tried to push up. Like, you push ups? Couldn't push up. And I said, oh. The guy did that. And I spent over an hour trying to push myself out of the ground and couldn't do it. Because God put his little finger in my back and pushed me down. And he, he said, and, and, and after I was exhausted trying to push up, I heard God, I, I asked God, I said, you know, you, is this like my permanent station? Am I going to be here forever like this? And, and God said, no. And he said, he says, you asked me for the last 10 days so my church would not be, you know, ridiculed. And he says, I'll do that for you. But today I'm going to give you something that you want. And that's what I got. I got that pressure coming down. That was an authority that God gave him up. That was, what, 15 years after I became a Christian? I was still hungry. Are you hungry? I know you guys want, and then we go to Hichiro, and you guys come out of that place like, you know, like you're high. You know, wow, oh, that's so cool. I want to be in that. I mean, last year we had people were, were like running after me after my room, and I said, leave me alone. You know? You know, God is still with you, still in the room, don't worry about me. What I'm trying to say is that, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? What is it that you want? And what are you willing to do for it? Are you willing to wrestle for it? Are you willing to, to, to hold on to God until he gives it to you? That's what he was doing there. He was holding on to God all night. He was holding, God blessed him because he held on to him all night. You know, we let go of God so easy when things get tough, we let go of God. When we don't get the things that we want. When the ministry that God reveals us, we don't get it, we just let go. Yeah, I mean, God forgot about me, God doesn't care about me. And some of you guys were called to sing. And you just let go of your ministry. You let go of the things because, you know, there's no room for me to some of you were called to preach. I'm not ready yet. Don't worry about that. God's gonna prepare, but you gotta hold on to God. You got you can't let go of God until He blesses you. You can't let go. I mean, God had to get me really ticked off for me to 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 fight for the church to the point where I had was I was exhausted. I, I was praying like five, six hours a day. I was exhausted because I hadn't eaten. But I was fighting. I was holding on to God because I didn't want to let go. And so he blessed. And God wants to bless us. But we're letting go for anything that comes, shows up in a way. Anything that can take the place of God, we just let go. No, God, that's too hard. No, God, I don't want to do that. Oh, no, God. God wants you to hold on. Until he changes something in your life. He changes the name of Jacob to Israel. But to you, it might not change your name. But he'll change the way you view yourself. Sometimes he'll change the way you think about what you could or could not do. Sometimes he changes the ministry that everybody says you have. And he'll say, no, that's not what I want from you. I want you to do this. When God gave me this word, he was telling me that, you know, we have to learn to wrestle with God and come out of winning. We need to learn to wrestle with God and come out victorious. We need to learn how to wrestle with God and come out with His blessing. So I want to pray for you guys. I want to pray for you. 
more than that, I want that this prayer might start for you something that he hasn't been there for a while. A desire to to be alone with God. I know you guys want to be in the midst of God's presence, but the whole text was talking about being alone with God. It didn't talk about being in a group with God. It talked about being alone with Him. Him dealing with our issues, Him transforming our lives. And I, I, it's hard and, 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 and for you to do this, but I want you just to step up if you want to spend some alone time with God. If you don't, it's fine. I'm not going to be upset. But I want to pray for you guys who want to spend some alone time with God. Because that's where you got, get that place where you get direction from God. You get to that place where, you know, you really find what God has in store for you. You're not going to find it in a, in a multitude of people. You find it in a long time. So I'm going to ask if you want to come up, come up. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's, it's a, something that comes inside you.